Awesome. Thank you, Chris. My name is Pat and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Pat. And uh, I can hear it. I can hear it. And uh, it's good. It's good to be in the Zoom world with all of you guys. And uh, thank you so much, Judith, for sharing. And and um, I just love you. And and uh, I was just, uh, man, I was in it. I was in the game, as Ralph, our, Ralph, our friend Ralph White would say. I was in the game. I was fully 100% present. You know what I mean? I wasn't even, I wasn't the water boy. And I was like, in it, man. I'm like, put me in, coach, you know? And, uh, and then all of a sudden, Chris is like, you're in. You know what I'm saying? All right, here I am. You know, the, the problem is, is I, I was the kid that always struck out. You know what I'm saying? So I hope I do all right t- today for you, Ralph. And uh, thanks for asking me to participate in my recovery. I I love Alcoholics Anonymous, man. I'm willing to do whatever I have to, you know, uh, in order for me to stay sober today. And and, and Ralph said, come join us. And I just felt honored. You know, I was like, really? Like, really? Me? Like, all right, put me in the game. Let's go, you know. And uh, and I'm just, I'm amongst my heroes, you know. Marilyn, I haven't seen Marilyn in a long time, but she used to come down to our meet my home group on Wednesday and, and talk and Bill and, you know, and I just, man, I just, here I am. And, uh, you know, and, and then uh, six and seven, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm in all of those things. You know what I mean? I'm like, wonder what they're going to think about me. You're a loser. You're a failure, man. They're all going to throw tomatoes right through the screen, <laughs> you know, hit me through the screen, you know, you know, cause it's worst case scenario. Like I know like that cannot happen. Right. But that's like the reality, you know, it's like really. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful to know that I have a disease of perception. You know what I mean? My perception to life is skewed. You know, I'm just like, just a little tiny bit, you know, and, uh, you know, and I sit here and I get present and, and, and I realize that, you know what, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. You know what I mean, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And um, and I start thinking about about how amazing my life is. And, and those that I don't know if we have any newcomers. I think we probably have some that maybe they have their screens off. Those that have their screens on. Thank you. I, I, it's good to like get get some head nods. You know, it's good to see my friend Doug. I love you, brother. And, um, you know, I uh, geez, what a what a cool thing. You know, and uh, my son, who's 16 now, walks in with my dry cleaning because I got to go to Ventura after this from Fullerton. Right. And he comes in with my dry cleaning because he drives himself there now. And and, uh, you know, I'm listening. I'm thinking, man, I wish I would have been here all day with you guys, you know, and I and I start to be real present to to the eighth and ninth step. And part of my eighth and my ninth step. Right. Is to be a dad to that boy. You know what I mean? To be a dad to that boy. And, And we woke up this morning. And, uh, and, and he, he's actually getting into sewing, right? He's got to, he, he's teaching himself how to sew and he go, his first project is to make these overalls, you know, and, and, and he wants to make them for me. And, and, you know, I, I grew up when I grew up, it was in the nineties, right? I remember the pants were like, you know, huge. And, and so we got these big 26 inch bottoms and he, he put, he sewed like a sheet together, like to make the, the pattern. What he did was he, he went through Amazon, got a Dickies pair, had him deliver it made a copy of the pattern, sent the Dickies back and then created more on his own, you know? And so today he woke up and we went and got corduroy because he's making his own. Right. And and I'm with him and I'm like, this is awesome. You know what I mean? I, I never met my dad. We'll get into eight and nine and you'll see why, but, but he comes walking in with, with, with the dry cleaning and he goes, dad, where do you want me to put these? You know? And I just hang them in my closet and then you know, he's going to make make his 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 uh, his overalls right now. He's going to drive himself over to mom's and make his overalls. And, you know, and, and I'm just filled with tremendous amount of gratitude for Alcoholics Anonymous, for a tremendous amount of gratitude for 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 those that have sobriety time before me that continue to show up and continue to be an example. I need to continue to show up for this thing, you know, because it's when I show up for this thing that I get to experience that moment. You know what I mean? But if I don't show up here, I'm not going to be able to experience that moment. And, uh, and, and, and I experienced that moment and I'm filled gratitude for, for the ninth, eighth, the ninth, you know, and, uh, because I'll tell you what, when I made amends to my father, my relationship with my son got so much deeper, you know? And, uh, I mean, I'm talking an intimate relationship, you know, we, we were at breakfast this morning and that, and that me and him had a little disagreement, and I expressed my feelings. He expressed his, you know, he apologized. I apologized, gave him a hug. Man, we went about our business. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, it is what it is. You know, it's all right that we disagree. 
you know, and uh, and I got that 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 promise that you know, that used to baffle me. That thing it used to baffle me. I didn't know how to deal with these emotions. I didn't know how to deal with with being in the moment. I didn't know how to hold space for you to be upset. I just reacted in 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 in, in six and seven, which we just talked about, right? And uh, and because of the night eighth and ninth step, I've grown up a little bit, just a little bit. Yeah, you know I mean, I still throw a temper tantrum every here and there, but but I but this morning I'm I'm in good stead. You know, I woke up this morning and uh, and I said, God, please. If you see fit, allow me to at least help one alcoholic today. And, and I go out and I do God's business. You know what I mean? I go do God's work. This is God's work. You know what I mean? I don't get to, right. I, I am doing it, man. Put me in the, put me in the game, you know? And, uh, and, uh, you know, and so, and so eight and nine are, are really important. I didn't really understand that the, the principle of the A step was forgiveness. You know what I mean? I thought it was like, well, if you're willing, you're knocking at the door. You know what I mean? My sponsor made me go knock on the door of my best friend who, you know, he, he, he was my best friend growing up and, and, and we did everything together in high school. And, and we were, we were like, you know what I mean? If there was a fight, we were back to back and we were fighting it and duking it out and, and we get through everything and, 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 um, and, 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 uh, and, he came, he came to my 25th birthday. I was in San Francisco. He came to my 25th birthday and he said, Pat, he's like, you know, we're, we're cool with drinking, but you can't be doing those drugs. And I said, oh, no, no, I don't do that stuff no more. Now I'll do that. Stuff. And so he drove all the way from Orange County to San Francisco to be with his best friend for his birthday. And there I was doing them drugs, nodded out on the couch, you know. And he walked in and he said, how did you lie to me one more time? You know what I mean? And I'm like, ah, oh, it's all good. You know, here's, here's a beer, you know, it's all good, you know. And he got in his car, man, and he left and he drove all the way back, literally six hours there, stayed for five minutes, right? And uh, and so, you know, I get sober and I'm, and, uh, and I'm making amends. I got like 60 days making the amends, you know. And, you know, my sponsor said, if you're willing, you're knocking at the door and I'll I'm like, hey, I'm here, you know, uh, here to make an amends, you know, for my behavior. And he he said, you know what? I don't I don't give two Fs about you, about about you. I don't give two Fs about that AA program. I don't give two Fs about your ninth step. He said, I don't ever want to see you again. And I care less if you die. And uh, man, I was like, well, I thought I thought this AA thing, I thought we were going to heal. I thought things were going to come together. I had this expectation Right. It wasn't about him. It was about me. One hundred percent. Right. To get rid of my guilt and my shame. It was still selfish motive, you know, and uh, but I didn't know that. I just following the goofy sponsor guy. You know, I just go do that, you know, and I did that. And, you know, and uh, and, and and I call my sponsor. He said, well, I guess it's water over the dam. You know, you did you did the best you can. And uh, he said, just go out there and help another alcoholic. I said, OK. And so I did. I turned my attention somebody I could help, you know what I mean? And I help people and I kept going and I, I kept doing the things. And, and, uh, I'd be honest with you. I didn't even know I was going to talk about this story, but here I am, you know? And so God is moving me. That's beautiful. I love when I can feel and see that. And so what happened was, was, uh, I, my, my son was born and me, I was at his mom's work and we were outside. He, he was a UPS driver and he, he kept driving on up and he looked at me and said, Pat, is that you? And I said, yeah, he said, it's good to see you. And he just kept going. You know, and uh, about a year later, I was walking with a sponsee in that same area and he drove by and he said, Pat, is that you? And I said, yeah. He said, hey, maybe we could get coffee sometime. This was like seven years from when I made the amends, seven years. And then he friend requested me on Facebook, you know, and I was like, and I called the sponsor. Okay, do I, now is the time. Do I, do I message him now to, to make this amends? And uh, he said, no, you, you don't, you don't, you already did what you can. You just let God direct what's happening. And uh, I said, OK, man, I'll do that. You know, and so I just kept helping people. And and uh, and, she went, you know, a couple of years later, he uh, he sends me a message and he says, Pat, he said, I've been watching you on Facebook. And uh, he said, I hope that I could one day be the dad that you are. One day. And, uh, you know, I just I thanked him. I just said, you know, thank you for your kind compliment. I said, because Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm able to be the father to my son that I am. And I let it go at that. I let it go at that. I didn't need to rush into some amends or anything. And and I started to feel this like this. Uh, started to feel forgiveness, started to feel this letting go of like any kind of resentment that I had, any lingering resentment that I had towards this guy because he didn't let me make the amends. He he did all these little things, right? Like I, I started to feel this letting go process. And um, and uh, 
two, maybe two or three years after that, we had made, maybe made, made a couple messages back and forth, you know, how you doing good, you know, whatever. And I see on Facebook that his mom had, had passed away and my mom had just passed away maybe a year before. Right. And you, you wonderful people and Alcoholics Anonymous showed up for me. You know what I mean? You showed up for me and I knew through your example, right. Of what to do. Right. So I did, I reached out and, and I said, uh, you know, I knew that they were in Vegas. I said, I'm on my way. Sent him a message. I said, I'm on my way. I'd love to come help you clean the house. And he said, oh, no, Pat, you don't have to do that. I, I said, it would be an honor for me too, right? And, and I showed up like you guys showed up for me. And and I went there and I, and I helped clean his mom's, uh, his mom's, it was, a, what do you call those, uh, mobile homes. And I stayed there and I started cleaning with him and his brother and his dad. And um, and we went to dinner and we sat down for dinner and, and he started to cry. And, uh, and he thanked me. He said, I don't have a single friend that would show up, you know, and, um, and you showed up, you know, and, um, I went back and I, and I clean, cleaned some more. I cleaned for two and a half more days. He left. I stayed with his brother and his dad. And, you know, uh, two months ago, he reached out to me and said, my, my brother-in-law's uh, struggling with, with alcoholism and drug addiction. You think you can help him? The amends was made. <laughs> I didn't have to verbally make the amends. It was about me changing my behavior. It was about me showing up, right? And in, in, in the times where it wasn't, it wasn't convenient. I had to give up work. I had to give up all those things. But but it was in the change behavior. We practice these principles in all of our affairs, right? It was it was about change behavior. It was about about being somebody different. And um, you know, and, and that guy calls me and he's today, you know, and says, Hey, I'm having a struggle with my my relationship or my kids. And and can you just listen and chat? And uh and I get to listen and I get a chat and I get to be present and 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 I and I realize that I'm in the game, you know. I mean, I'm I'm in the deal, man. This is what we're doing. We're doing this is a way of life for me. This isn't this isn't something that I do. Let's check box the deal. Check box done. Check. No, no, this is a way, a way of living. And, um, you know, and, and I'm, and I'm grateful, you know, I'm grateful. I get to talk about eight and nine. I give a plug for, for Woodstock West. And I think it was Marshall, Marshall, man, you get out there for sure, man, get out there. I'll tell you what, what happened when my mom passed away. I got a, I got a message from Ralph and, and he said, Hey, I never, I never heard you talk and I don't even know who you are, but, but God told me has come to me and, and, and he asked me to come fill in for my mom who was supposed to speak there. And, uh, man, my heart cracked wide open, my heart cracked wide open. And, uh, and Judith did the same thing for me and, and my heart cracked wide open and it was cold there. I don't know how it cracked wide open in Bismarck, North Dakota <laughs> in the freezing cold but but it did right because of because of being of service and uh you know and service in alcoholics anonymous means a lot to me it means a lot to me because of steps eight and nine because of steps eight and nine what happened was was what and i give you a little 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 backstory is that my mom got sober when i was 11 months old and uh my mom was being sentenced to prison for 10 for 10 years because she's a kind of alcoholic that that gets drunk and then jumps out and beats the cop up you know what i mean like 10 times you know and uh and a lot of you have heard my mom speak and and uh and and so she brought me to AA when I was 11 months old. I grew up in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You good folks raised me, you know, and uh, and it was a beautiful thing to grow up here, you know. But my mom's also a blackout drinker, right? Well, which means I'll never know who my dad is, you know. I mean, for all I know, my dad could be the cable guy. For all I know, you know. But 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 she comes here, and I have no dad. I'm, a, I'm an only child. I'm a bedwetter, you know pre-alcohol. You know, I'm just full with shame. Man. As a little kid, I had so much shame being a bedwetter. I was alone. Um, I have the nervous disposition the big book talks about. I mean, I still bite my nails today. You know I mean? I was right when Judith was talking, I was, you know, and then I'm like, oh wait, they're going to see, you know, and, and I'm a not, you know, and uh, I just have that an anxious thing with me. And, uh, and I remember as a little kid, uh, I would always wonder where my dad was. You know, I mean, I was like, wow, you know, why does it seem if they have a dad, I don't have a dad. And I was like, I'm a thinker. I'm a, I'm a real good. I think a lot. And uh, and I'm thinking and I'm thinking and I, and I create all these solutions. I mean, I create these solutions that are worse than the problem. You know, I create these storylines that aren't even real. And, and one day I was a little I remember being a little kid and I thought, you know what? Like, I don't have a dad. There is no God. Right. Like I equated God with dad. 
And and I didn't know anything until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, but you know, and uh, and I signed off on this idea of of God, you know, as a little kid. You know, my grandma took me to church and she did the deal. She was dancing, put her hands up, you know that they do. And I was like, what's something wrong with me? Because I don't seem to be getting what grandma's getting. You know, I didn't get that feeling until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, what I get in AA is what grandma got back then. But I didn't know, you know, she would spin me around in circles and want to dance. And I was thinking, grandma, they're going to see me. Like I was embarrassed. Um, you know, I, I went to youth church camp things. I just, I, I was, this is, it was phony to me, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just, uh, and what happened for me was when I drank alcohol, I had a spiritual experience, man. That, that's the only way I can describe it. Right? It, it connected me to you. It connected me to God. And it connected me to the spirit within me. Like it just, there was a connection there. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, ran, I ran the deal. I was 17 years old. My mom was like, you know what? She's like, you can't drink and smoke weed and live in this sober household, right? She was 16 years sober. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know how you hear that, but I heard I need to hide it better. You know what I mean? I was like, man, you're not doing a good job. She found it. And so I hide it better. And, and you know, my mom would speak all over the country. I'd have parties at her house. She'd go to fly to another state and I would steal her truck. You know what I mean? I'd had no respect for my mom's recovery. None. You know what I mean? I had a party at her house, 250 people. The sheriff showed up, you know, and she's in Kansas, you know, carrying a message, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and I'm just a complete selfish, self-centered um, human being. And, and I don't know it. I don't know that like anything. I, I just, I, I didn't know I couldn't stop. I didn't know that I, it was a problem. And and at 17, my mom found the, the, the alcohol and the weed one more time. And, and she said, you're kicked out of the house. And, uh, and like, I don't know how, like, I mean, the nor the regular person would say, "Hey, in order to live here, you got it. Okay, don't don't drink and use." Not me. I go in the bedroom, I pack my backpack, and I walk by my mom and I look her right in the eyes and I say, "I'm going to do everything I can to ruin your life." And uh, I watched my mom's heart break. You know, in that moment, like literally, just like shat, like right in front of me, just crumble. And I watched her start to cry, and and my mom wasn't a crier. You know, and. Uh, and I just was like, I didn't know what to do, man. I was like, I just broke my mom's heart, right? I, I just, I, and, and, I, and, and, I, and I need to get more alcohol. And, and, I, and I just grabbed my mom by the collar. I, sl- I just snapped, man. I grabbed my mom by the collar and I slammed her against the wall. And I, I effed her and I, I called her names and, and uh, I told her I hated her. And I told her, you're never going to see me again. And, uh, and I left that night and, uh, and I went to an abandoned house where I was getting loaded at and my disease progressed really fast into a lot of other substances that night, 17, it was, it was a a situation in my life that I remember clearly, right. I don't know where the invisible line was. I think I was already alcoholic way before that, but I could not stop drinking and alcohol told me to put my hands on my mom and alcohol, uh, you know, all of it was driven by that. And I left that night and I would be homeless from the age of 17 till I got sober at 27. And, um, and I would go in and out, right. I would go in and out and, uh, and, and I would get a girlfriend for a period of time. And, and, um, well, she was kind of like my mom, you know what I mean? She was like, you need to get a job and you can't do this and you can't do that. And, uh, but I loved her. And, and so I would do what she wanted me to do. Right. And I would get a job. I remember getting a job one time at an elementary school as an, as an assistant director for, for an after school program. And I'm a full blown alcoholic drug addict who can't stop. I get like 30 days, 60 days, get the good job, right? And one of those little spurts, man, I got that good job and I was the assistant director and I show up and there's 200 elementary school kids and they love Pato, right? Because in between, man, I got that charisma. I got that personality, right? I, I, I get you to love me, you know what I'm saying? Even though I'm so selfish, man. And uh, and, and for two days, like I, I go home and I kiss the girlfriend. I love you so much. I'm never going to drink. This time's going to be different. And I make the promise and I mean the promise. And and there's this love. And, and I go back to work on the third day with these 200 elementary school kids. And I have the thought that thinks a pint of tequila and some drugs and make this a good, better day. And, I, and, and sure enough, I called a friend and he brought some things at elementary school. And, and I passed out in the bathroom of the elementary school bathroom. And uh, now late, the director of that after school program broke in the door, kicked the door open, 
And she said some F bombs at me and she told me what a piece of trash I was. And she told me, you need to get the F out of here and just cuss me. And I deserved every minute, man. And I remember walking out of that elementary school and seeing those little kids faces, man, just like, like, where's Pat going? Like, there's my buddy. Where's my buddy going? Right. And I let down all these kids and I let down the director and I go home to the, to the girlfriend. And I let her know that I just got fired and what happened. I let somebody else down. Right. And, and I don't want to be that guy. Right. I don't want to be this guy that breaks down doors and hurts people. And I'm just not, I'm not wired that way. I wasn't raised that way. I was raised in alcoholics. So I was raised with a lot of love, right. I knew what was wrong and I couldn't stop and I couldn't stop. And, 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 and I ended up going to treat and, and on the 20th of October, three days before I got sober, I got sober on the 23rd of October, 2002, I crawled out of, out of a motel sexually assaulted for the 12th time. And, um, and I drank because I had no other solution. It was going to kill myself or drink. And I drank and I, and I blacked out for three days and I came to, and, uh, and that, and I called my mom and I was like, I need help, you know? And my mom sent these people, these two guys for me, Hey, and they came and got me. There was no therapy. It was no, you know, it was no, let's talk about your feelings. It was like, this is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous right here. And this thing changed my life. They told me, they said the big book and the 12 steps changed my life. The big book and the 12 steps allow me to have joy for somebody else. And I was like, what? Joy for others? Talked about having happiness for other people. And I was like, You're, how are you happy for others? Like, I, I, that makes no sense to me. And I came to believe in the process. I came to believe in their stories. I'm grateful that, that, that we're a storytelling society because we tell our stories with one another, right? And through your stories, I remember listening, you know, Bill and Marilyn would come and Doug would come to our Wednesday meeting and I would sit and listen to you guys. And though our stories may be completely different, I could identify with the feelings, Right. I could say, you know what? I feel like that, man. I remember one time I laughed for the first time in an AA meeting. Larry, Larry Thomas was talking and, 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 and I laughed gut level, man. I was, and then I was thinking, Oh, you shouldn't laugh at that. You know what I mean? And my perception, I don't even know if this was true. I was still really self centered. I really believe Larry looked at me and said, if you're laughing, we got you. You know what I mean? And, and I thought I was like, Oh, you know, and, uh, but really like I laughed. Right. And, uh, and, and I came to believe in this deal and, and the sponsor guy was big about the steps and, you know, he didn't make me believe in God. He broke down alcoholism in a way I looked at him and I said, I'm alcoholic. And I believed it to inner innermost being of who I am. And I came to believe that joy and happiness that he felt for others that maybe I could have, I made a decision, do what he told me to do. And we started writing inventory day one, right? Like literally my first amends, was four days sober, right? I was at a place called Charlie Street, you know, and all we did was we sat and read the book. And when there was an action, we took an action and 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 we were at that four step and we wrote it and I read it. And it wasn't like crazy. It wasn't, it was as much as I could give at the time, as much as I could give at the time. I told you my deep dark secret. I, I couldn't get there till I was 10 years sober. But but what happened was 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 I had to look at my little amends, right? The little the little things like you know what you have a warrant and you're going to prison for three and a half years. You need to clean that up. <laughs> and so four days sober, you know what I mean? I go clean that up, and I said I don't want to go to prison. I, I, if I go to, I'm going to see the judge. He's going to sentence me to three and a half years in prison. He's like, how do you know? I go, I promised, man. He told me the next time because I was in and out, in and out, in and out, right? And uh, and so he goes, well, no, it's all good now. You're sober now, and you have God in your life, and. I was like, no, remember, I don't believe in God. He's like, you can borrow mine, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, right? The little things that sponsors say, you can borrow my God, you know? And sure enough, I go to the court and I stand there and the judge says, yeah, you're going to prison for three and a half years. And the guard came and cuffed me up and I'm going to the holding tank talking to myself, you know what I mean? Because I still have all that shame and I still have all that guilt and I'm still terrified and I, and I don't have a God in my life, right? But I'm showing up because that's what the sponsor tells me to do. And, uh, and, sh and just in showing up has so much power. And I didn't know just showing up had any power, right? I didn't know I felt, felt powerless. I'm doing it because he wants me to do it. I'm a people pleaser, right? All this like stuff. And I show up and, and I'm going to the, to, and I'm, you know, I'm sh Dan, I go downstairs and I'm like, how do you trust that guy again? I'm mad at myself. Really, right? I'm, I'm just angry at myself. You shouldn't have trusted that guy. Everybody in your life has failed you. And one more time, 
That guy failed you. He told you everything was going to be all right. He told you you can believe in his God. His God's really small because you're going to prison and uh, can't take any accountability for my life. And uh, I'm so grateful for John Ackerland. And uh, John Ackerland told me when I was brand new, he said, kid, I don't care if you believe or not. He said, get on your pr- on your knees and go, hey, God, I don't believe you exist, but old guy John told me to pray and then tell your God your prayers as if you believed. And so I did that day. I got on my knees and I go, God, I don't believe that you exist, but old man John told me to pray. Get me out of here. You know, amen. And, uh, and, and, and I'm getting shackled up to get on the bus to go to prison. And now I'm having that conversation. You prayed and God didn't work. You trusted that guy and the NAA failed you and people fail you. And, and sure enough, the bus door closed and the engine starts and I'm, I'm just like, go oh, on. I can't believe it. You know? And, uh, Oh, the door opened up and, and and the guard says, hey, I don't know what's going on, but the judge wants to see you one more time. I said, oh, OK, uh, me. And the, j- the guard's like, yeah, you idiot, get up. You know? And so I get up and I, and I go out there and I walk upstairs. I'm sitting in front of the judge and the judge says, I don't know why I'm doing this, but but I'm going to give you another chance. He said, there's a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he pointed to my goofy sponsor dude, in the corner of the courtroom. He's like, that guy has been fighting for you all day to get out. And he was one of those headhunter guys, you know, that would call you and steal you from your job and take you somewhere else. So he was used to like calling all the time, you know, and and, and his his uh, liability became an asset that day. I'll tell you. And, and, and sure enough, I get I get out of I get out of jail and I go up to the Salvation Army and I'm met by a man by the name of Tim. Tim's like, hey, Pat, how you doing? And what happened was, was my sponsor called over and over and over. And this guy had gotten sober and he became a drug and alcohol counselor and he wanted to do a good job. So he went in the room where the printer was and he answered the phone. He wasn't even supposed to answer it. And my sponsor goes, I got this kid, Pat Ochoa, who needs a bed. And he said, I got a bed for him. And Tim was a guy I used to get loaded with. And when he heard Pat Ochoa, right, he said, I got a bed. Now, see, God was working in my life, though I couldn't see it, right? And, and I started these amends and I, and I went to the, to the jobs and I went to the girlfriends that would see me and, and, and I, I did the best I could. And I sit down with my mom uh, and, and I said, Hey mom, I said, you know, because what happened was, was my mom, what she wired me like $150 every week, you know, my good AA mom, you know, and, and I would call her and I was like, mom, I got in an accident and I need help. And uh, my mom's like, well, how am I going to help you? I said, I, I don't know how I'm going to pay for the hospital. And she said, well, why don't you just send me the address and I'll send them a check. And I was like, oh, no, 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 mom, they need cash. you know." And so my mom would wire me money, do like one hundred and fifty dollars every week for like eight years until she went to Al-Anon. You know? Then the, the language changed a little bit, you know, like you call and ask for money. And she's like, no. And I'm like, no. She's like, no's a full sentence. You know, I'm like, oh, my God, no's a full sentence. I'm like, well, mom, if I only had a dad, I wouldn't be in this situation. It's all your fault. And I hit that guilt button and my mom would go wire me the money. And I would call my mom and tell her how much I loved her and how much she was my hero. And she'd wire me the money. And uh, and I didn't have a dad and it was all her fault. And and so I sit down with my mom, 90 days sober. And, and I was like, I said, hey, mom, I said, I need to make amends. And she's thinking, oh, it's about time, you know. And uh, and she's got, I think she, I, I was 27. So she was 26 years sober at the time. And, and I sit down with my mom and, and I said, mom, I said, do you remember that one time I told you I got in an accident? I said, it was a lie. And she looked at me and she said, I know it was a lie. And I was like, hey, remember that one time I told you I need to work clothes? I said, that was a lie. She goes, I know that was a lie too. I said, do you remember that one time? And she just stopped me in, in the tracks and she said, Patrick, she said, you know what? She goes, I know that every time you ask for money, it was a lie. And I was kind of baffled. I was like, and I asked her, I said, mom, I said, why, why did you send me the money? And she said, because when you left my house at 17, you broke my heart. And every night from 17 till I got the call on the 23rd of October, I would fall asleep in tears and cry and terrify I was going to get that call. And she said, I thought that if I gave you the money, it might keep you alive long enough for you to get to Alcoholics Anonymous so the men in Alcoholics Anonymous could save your life. And, um, I got really present to the harm that it caused another human being, right? I, I I thought that it was the lie. The harm was that I robbed my mom of her security day in and day out. 
yeah, step four was good, right? I could see like my mistakes. I could see my selfishness. I could see that stuff. But when I sat down with, with my mom and, and had a real conversation about what had really happened, I got present to the way that my behavior hurt another human being. And I started to cry. I was just like, holy cow, I didn't want to hurt my mom like that. I didn't want to make my mom feel like that ever. And, and I started to cry. And I, and I just said, mom, I don't know how I'm going to make this right, you know? And um, I said, what can I do? What can I do? Like, tell me, please. And and um, and she said, I just want you to get in the middle of AA and help as many people as you can, you know. And um, I told my mom I loved her for the first time in my life. I felt love for my mom, 26, six, six years, seven years old, you know. And, uh, and I hugged my mom and I told my mom I loved her. And I, told her I was grateful for her in my life. And, and she just thanked me for coming to see her. And she said, I'm just grateful that you're sober. And uh, I went to my sponsor. I called him, you know, cause I didn't believe in God, but I came to believe in AA. And I was like, this AA thing is amazing. Like there's healing happening here, right? Like there's healing happening right here in this, in me telling my story, I can feel the spirit healing, healing. And, uh, and that's what we had. And I, I, I give with the sponsor. I said, this is, I can't believe it. Like, this is amazing, you know? And uh, he said, well, what did she want you to do to make it right? I said, she just wants me to get in the middle of AA and help people, you know? And he was like, well, that's great. He said, but what about the money? I said, well, she didn't want the money. He said, yeah, but AA wants you to pay it back, you know? And I thought, oh, my God, don't tell this guy anything, dude. He's like, you're going to pay the money. I said, how am I going to pay back $100,000 or more? He goes, $25 at a time, you know? I'm like, oh, my God, $25 at a time. I'm going to be paying for the rest of my life, you know? And uh, I said, well, how am I going to pay? He said, what I want you to do is I want you to write a note that says, Mom, I love you and I appreciate you today. And leave her 25 bucks every Friday. Write the note, leave the money. So every Friday I would write the note, mom, I love you and I appreciate you. And I leave her 25 bucks. Mom, I love you and I appreciate you. And I leave her 25 bucks. And so we did this thing, me and my mom for like, for like six months. And then the sponsor called me, he goes, Pat, he's like, you're doing a good job. You know, we all need them accolades, right? He said, you're, he's like, I'm really proud of you, man. You're, you're doing the amends and you're, and you're showing up to AA and, and you're being a service and you're helping people. He said, uh, he said, oh, and, and, and you're giving her the money once a week. He said, I think it'd be a really good idea if you wrote a note to your mom every day and just leave the money once a week, but write the note every day. And so I did. I was writing my mom a note every day. Mom, I love you and I appreciate you today. Mom, I love you and I appreciate you. And then once, once a week, I leave the money and and over time, what had happened was the notes started to change, right? From that little bit of, I love you and I appreciate you today, all of a sudden, I appreciate you for da, da, da. I appreciate you for, I remember when I was five years old, you took me to the baseball game. Mom, thank you for taking me to Hawaii when you got asked to speak at the Hawaii State Convention and we got to spend that extra week in Maui. And, and thank you for, you know, um, teaching me how to, to, to live life. And, you know, by starting all of a sudden the things were getting long love letters, you know what I mean? And I, I mean, they, they sometimes they even had some tears dropped on them, you know what I mean? Little, little, little water drops, you know what I mean? Kind of like love letters, you know, I love you so much, you know? And, and I started to realize in, in AA that, that like people were getting boyfriend and girlfriends, you know what I mean? And I'm over here having a love affair with my mom. Like, this is weird, you know? And, and so I called the sponsor. I said, sponsor, I said, I can't do this anymore. This is getting weird. Like I'm having a love affair with my mom and, and, uh, and he said, Pat, he's like, you don't have to do it anymore. And I'm thinking, heck yeah. He said, but how free do you want to be, kid? Oh, I love you and I appreciate you today. Write the love letter, right? Because I want to be free. It wasn't about like anything other than me feeling good, right? It was still selfish motive. It was still, right? There still was this, just let me be real. There was just still a level of unforgiveness that I didn't have for my mom. I didn't really forgive my mom right? It was still about me feeling good on the inside. I was still mad at my mom, right? For putting the women and Alcoholics Anonymous in front of my life, right? I remember we, I would go to AA and my mom would light up like a chandelier in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, man. My mom, I remember going to a convention with my mom and the, the, the people would part ways, you know what I mean? And they would be so happy to see patio, you know? And, uh, and I was like a little shadow in my mom's, my, in my mom's presence, you know? And I would get in the car and I'd go home and it was the most coldest ride ever. Right. It was the most coldest ride ever. Like my mom did. not I don't I don't really ever felt like my mom had this like this nurture and love for me. Right. At that time. Right. And so what happened was, was 
was was I just kept taking the action. I just kept taking the action. I kept taking the action. And, you know, an AA boy met AA girl on AA campus. And well, what happened was we, we went to Vegas and she got pregnant. So what happened in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas. You know what I mean? And uh, and so she, we got she got pregnant and uh, and my mom was there taking pictures when my son was born. You know what I mean? I with that was kind of weird, but my mom had a job and my mom was taking. And I remember when my son came out, I looked right into the eyes of God. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't know how to ha- be a dad. I would call the women in AA and I'm like, I'm like, he has the hiccups. What do I do? And you'd be like, what do you do when you have the hiccups? I'm like, I wait. And you would hang up on me. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I would listen to you guys share in AA and you would talk about the pain of, of, of the father of your child, not paying child support. And through your pain, I learned how to be a father to my child, right? Through your pain of talking about the father not showing up for visitation, I learned how to show up and, and, and be present through your pain. And, 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 and I remember why like, I didn't know how he would cry. I was like, why are you crying? And I, I would freak out. And, and, and one time I put him on my head and, and he stopped crying. You know what I mean? And I was so proud. I was like, yeah, Look, I mean, him just walked around all the time like this at the moment. Hey, cause he didn't cry. And, and, uh, and I was at my apartment one time and, and my sponsee was there and I stood up at my desk, just like I am now. I stood up and I put him on my head and I put his head right into a ceiling fan, dude. It was like, and it, and the ceiling fan just went whack, 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 you know? And I was like, oh my God. And I handed my, my, my kid to my sponsee and I went to the back back room and I go, God, I don't believe that you exist, but old man, John told me to pray. Dude, I don't know what to do. Help me. And I heard a voice that was like, you need to call the doctor. And I was like, Whoa, that's profound, you know? And so I called the doctor and the doctor told me what to do. And he, you know, I said, look in his eyes. And, and so I did, I grabbed my kid and I looked at him in the eyes and he didn't have a concussion. There was nothing wrong with him. He had a little bump on his head. That was it. But what happened for me in that moment, right? What happened for me in that moment was that I care more about another human being than I cared about myself. I've been overpaid. If I can just get that feeling, that little bit of selfishness by showing up, right? And uh, because of my behavior in Alcoholics Now, I have 20 minutes. Uh, what happened was, was I was terrified. I was, I was scared. I got to move my computer and plug it in. I was scared. I was scared to, uh, I didn't know how to be, uh, well, long story short, I, I ended up cheating on my son's mom and, uh, and, um, and, uh, I hated myself. I would go to AA. I thought maybe I'm doing it wrong. And I got another relationship. I did the same thing. I got another relationship. I did the same thing. I got another relationship. I did the same thing. And, uh, and I would go home every night, want to put a bullet in my mouth. And, um, at eight and a half years sober, man, I, I was going to kill myself. And I was driving my car a hundred miles an hour down the road. And, and I heard a voice in the back seat that said, call that guy, Jonathan from your Tuesday night meeting before you kill yourself. And I picked up the phone. It was midnight. And I said, Jonathan, I said, yeah, I said, I'm going to kill myself, man. I, I don't know what's going on. man. I, I hate myself. I can't live like this anymore. And he said, before you kill yourself, he said, will you meet me at Denny's? And I said, yeah, I'll meet you at Denny's. And he got out of his bed at midnight with his wife and his two kids. And he drove 30 miles south to Denny's. And he walked in there and I sat there and I was crying. And he opened the book to page 52. And he talked about these bedevilments and having trouble with personal relationships and can't control your emotional nature is prey to misery and depression. And he looked at me and said, what you're suffering from is untreated alcoholism. And he asked me if I was willing to go back through these steps. And, and, and I was. And, um, and I was suicidal from eight and a half years sober till I was 10 years sober. And, um, and, um, and I went through these steps and, and he would call me and he would say, how's it amends to your dad coming along? And I said, I'm not going to make it, man. I said, I just can't do it, you know. And I called him on the, on the bridge, on the, on the cliff of Dana Point. And I said, I'm going to jump off and. And this guy started to become a father figure in my life. And I didn't even know it. And um, he said, Pat, he said, I love you like a son. He said, do you think you can meet me at the meeting tomorrow before you kill yourself? I'd like to say goodbye to you before you do. He didn't try to stop me. He didn't try to tell me not to. He welcomed the idea, actually. He just said, I'd like to say goodbye to you before you do it. And I went and I show, I said, I'll meet you at the meeting. And I showed up that next day and he kissed me on the forehead like a father would do to his son. And he said, I love you. And he said, we meet me at the meeting tomorrow. 
And I said, I'll meet you at the meeting tomorrow. And then I, on the bridge, you're going to jump. And he said, you said you're going to meet me at the meeting tomorrow. And, and so we did this dance. And every day you would say, how's it amends to your dad coming along? I said, I'm not going to make it, man. And we did this dance for a while. And I, st- I realized one day, I said, dude, don't call the guy, man. He's just going to tell you to meet him at the meeting. He's going to manipulate you, right? In that old head, right? That old head, the, those old ideas, right? That the book talks about, let, let go of the old ideas. Well, what are the old ideas? I don't even know. I got a list of defects, but I don't know what the old ideas are, right? I remember when I was a little boy, man, and, and I struck out. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what happened. It was a triple play in the wrong direction. I, I failed my team and I looked at my mom and she was clapping. So proud of her kid. And I remember that day, man, looking at my mom saying, if I only had a dad, that had never happened. You know, a little boy, man, already blaming my father dude, as a little kid. And, and here I am blaming my father for the life I had at, at, at what was, a, I don't know, I was 37 years old, 10 years sober. And, and, and I got this guy that's like my father figure. And it's just kind of confusing. And he wants me to make amends and I'm not willing to do it. And, and so I said, I'm not calling that guy. And I, I parked my car, I pulled my car over on the 57 bridge over the five freeway. And I said, God, For the first time in my life, I went from human dependence to God dependence. And I said, God, you have 10 seconds, dude. And I got out of my car and and, uh, I walked to the headlight of my my car and my phone rang. And I looked and it was a number. It was a kid named, it was was an unknown number. And I said, hello, this is Pat. Now I'm on the bridge about to jump. I said, this is Pat. He said, this is Chris. And I wanted to call and thank you because when I came to AA, he saved my life, you know. And, and I'm leaving AA because I'm going to go get loaded, but I just wanted to call and thank you. And, and I started, I said, hey, Chris, I said, we don't drink one day at a time here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started to talk about my thinking that preceded the first drink. And, and, I, and I, I realized that it was seven and I realized there was a meeting at the Canyon Club starting at 730. I said, Chris, you want, will you meet me at the meeting? 730. I said, I'd like to say goodbye to you before, before you get loaded. And, uh, he said, yeah, I'll meet you at the meeting. And so I got in my car and I drove 30 miles south down to the candy club. And I walked in the candy club that day and there was Chris and Chris was crying. And, and Chris thanked me for saving his life. And Chris asked me to be his sponsor. And I, I, I said, yes. I said, yeah, I'll be your sponsor. I didn't tell him I was going to kill myself. I just said, yes, I'll be your sponsor. And and I go home that night and and it's three in the morning and I can't sleep. And I got the going and I got the thing going. I got my sponsor. Just make the amends to your dad. I got his voice. Make the amends to your dad. Make the amends to your dad. And I'm just holding on, holding on. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to do it. And uh, and I felt a hand push me off the couch and I'm on the floor in my apartment. And I'm screaming and I'm crying at God and I'm cussing out God. F you. I hate you. You put another alcoholic to help in my life and I just want to die I just want to die and and all of a sudden the words came out of my mouth and I started to make amends to a man I never met where had I been selfish and self-centered and self-seeking and fright in every area of my life if I only had a dad I know how to be a girlfriend our boyfriend to a girlfriend. If I only had a dad, I know how to be a friend to you. If I only had a dad, I know how to show up for work. If I only had a dad, if I only, and I blamed every situation in my life on not having a dad, that little boy at that baseball field, that old idea. Right. And, uh, and, 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 um, man, I just, I, I all started, start making amends to this guy, you know, and, um, and all of a sudden the victim was pulled out and the power of God, which was love went deep down within I got off the floor that day, man. I went to my bed and I fell asleep just like that. And um, it was the last amends I had to make, you know. In the 10th step promise, it talks about we've entered the world of the spirit, you know. And I entered the world of the spirit at that point. And we're going to, other people are going to talk about 10, 11, and 12, which allows me to stay present and be able to be within that spirit. But what happened in that, that moment was that was what happened. And, um, you know, I, I had this old idea, man, that um, that from from the relationship with my mom, right, that drove me. Like I was driven by this idea uh, that that women authority figure had power over my desires, you know. And, and I went back and I made amends to, to all to all four of those women. And one, what wouldn't? And and today I have friends with those people, you know, because of the ninth step. And um, <laughs> I sit in the home group with all five of them, which is awkward, but. Um, But five weeks before my mom died, man, um, 
you know, my mom rocked an oxygen tank, like nobody's business, you know, and uh, me and my mom spoke all over the country together and with that tank, you know, and, um, right before her 40th AA part birthday, she was on life support. She came out, she lived, you know, and, uh, my mom was my hero, you know, and, um, and it was the Wednesday night meeting and we had a speaker speak that night and she called me after and she was like, ah, complaining about the speaker, you know, I, like you guys might do after this talk, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, but, uh, and, she, and, and I said, mom, I said, I love you very much. I said, I'll see you in the morning. All right, mom. And she said, all right, I'll see you in the morning. And I went, I went to go see her that morning and, and her wife had to call 911 because she had a tumor that blocked the passageway. She couldn't, couldn't breathe. They stopped testing her for cancer because she was like the number one rehab person being a service traveling. And so they kind of stopped testing and, and the tumor. And I got angry at, at the doctors and, and, uh, and, uh, and they cored out the tumor and they put her on hospice. And I called my mom and she said, I, you know, I'm only going to go on hospice because they want me to, you know what I mean? But I'm going to get off hospice. Don't worry about it. You know? And I was like, okay, you know, mom. And sure enough, like a, I don't know, a week or two later, she was back at the home group and back at the women's meeting and back reading the book. You know what I mean? I'm like gangster mom, you know, and, and everything was back at normal. And, um, home group again called me you know I see in the morning and that morning I went to her house and the tumor had grown back a hundred percent and uh I knew it was the end you know and I would go to her room to see her where she was man and, and the women and alcoholics nine was surrounded my mom my mom would tell me, don't sit here and watch me die. Go out there and live your life. But come back tomorrow and give me a kiss, will you? It was the hardest thing I had to do. And I remember leaving one day and I was just, I was like, I was reflecting on the day and I, and I, all the women that were there and I had that old resentment come back, right? That I, that resentment that, that the women and alcoholics now took my mom from me, right? And, and, and in that moment of reflection, I had this tremendous amount of gratitude, right? Because my mom's spirit was alive because of the women and alcoholics anonymous, right? And all this forgiveness just filled through my whole body. And I was speaking in, in Idaho and I didn't want to go, man. I was like, dude, I'm not going. I'm not going to miss my mom, you know? And, and I got on my knees and I was like, God, I don't know what you want me to do. And, and I heard a voice, man. It was like, you need to be a service to Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, I don't like that answer. That's not what I want. I want to be there when my mom dies, right? Because all the best speakers that I ever heard said the greatest gift, they were there when their loved one took their last breath. And I want your experience. I don't want to walk through my own. I want, just tell me what to do, Right. And so I, but I, at this point I learned, I pray, ask God, I take the action. And so day two, I get the same response. Be a service day. Hey, I don't like it. So I pray three days in a row. And then I call the sponsor sponsor. What do you want me to do? And he said, what did God want you to do? I'm like, Oh, hangs up on me. I go see my mom. I kiss her on the forehead. I said, mom, I love you. I'll be back. You know, and I didn't tell my mom where I was going. I just kissed her on the forehead. I said, I'll be back. And, and I flew to, I flew to Idaho and, Saturday night, I get a call from, from my friend, Michelle, and she says, your mom's been unresponsive. She hasn't moved. She's been unresponsive for two days. And you need to hurry up and get back because she's waiting to say goodbye. And I got on my knees right there in that auditorium. And I said, God, I don't know what you want me to do, but I'm willing to do whatever it is. And I heard a voice that said, you need to be a service to Alcoholics Anonymous. I gave a talk that night. The next morning I flew home and I, I, I like a hundred miles an hour barrel into my mom's, my mom, where my mom is at, where she's laying in the hospice bed. And I barged in the front door and my mom sat straight up like this. Spirit felt spirit walk in the room that day. And I went into my mom's arms, man. She put her arms around me and she said, Pato, I want you to know you did the right thing. And she held me and she said, I love you. I love you. I love you. And that was the last words that my mom said, you know. And uh, two or three days later, my mom died and my heart broke, you know. But what happened for me in that moment was that there was a level of forgiveness that was so profound, man. 
I honored my mom's amends all the way to the day that my mom died. All she wanted me to do was to get in the middle of you and to help you. And I honored that all the way to the end. When my sponsor said to me, how free do you want to be? All the little notes, right? Showing up to the literature commitment, showing up for the secretary commitment, showing up for the thing, showing up for this, showing up for that, right? In that moment, right? It all came full circle in that moment. And, uh, and, and my heart broke and, um, and, uh, I ended up, uh, I ended up getting this relationship four days after my mom died, which I know intellectually like bad idea. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know how you go into grief or how you deal with it. It's not a, it's not like a, uh, you know what I mean? It's like a wow deal. You know what I mean? And it's like, wow, you know, you put the seatbelt on, let's go, you know? And, and so I got in it, you know, and it was nine months of just, whoa, you know what I mean? Like, whoa. And, uh, and so nine months into it, man, I, I, broke. I finally was like, I, I couldn't do it anymore. And, and I sought, I sought some outside help, you know, and, um, and, and I, and I cried for a long time. And, and, uh, but sitting in that office one day, sitting in that office one day, I realized that I was the block in my mom's relationship with me. I didn't open up to my mom about how I felt growing up. I didn't open up to my mom about anything. I didn't let my mom in emotionally. I didn't have an an intimate relationship with my mom, though I blamed her for not having it with me. In that office, I realized that my mom was thrown to a plate glass window by her alcoholic father. She took the abuse, right? And, And so what happened was, was I knew I owed my mom an amends, but my mom had passed, right? And so I, 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 I got with my sponsor and I got into prayer and I took some of her ashes and I went and found this tree over here, over in Fullerton where I live. And, and I'd walk through this park just randomly, like, you know, God, show me where I'm supposed to go. You know, this kind of kooks, you know what I mean? I don't know if you ever felt that way. And, and, uh, but I know God was doing exactly what God does in my life all the time as he brings me to you. And I got a call from another member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, I'm just randomly walking around. And he said, what is the nearest tree? And I looked, I said, well, it's right here. It's like two feet away. He goes, maybe that's where God wants you to be. I said, all right, man. And I got down on my knees to this tree and I, and I started to make an amends. I started to pray and I started to have a conversation with my mom. And I poured the, I started pouring the ashes and, and I started to make amends for not letting my mom into my heart emotionally. But I didn't have the intimacy that I wanted from my mom. I didn't bring that to the table. And I said, Mom, what can I do to make this right? And I'm going to read something. And, um, and this is what I got. I said, it says, be open and honest. Be transparent. Be kind. Talk to Eden. Eden is my son. Talk to Eden about your struggles. Be emotional with him. Be gentle. She said, don't cheat on women, have integrity with women, follow your dreams. Don't give up on your dreams. Bring those you love close to your heart. Be welcoming, face your fears, live life to the fullest. Be gentle. Forgive yourself for I have forgiven you, dude. And I would jumped up, dude. I jumped up. I was so scared. I just ran away from the tree, man. And I literally felt this pull, man. It was like a pull back to the tree. And I was like, bro. And I, I was just, I, and I, and I, and I went back and I sat down and I said, mom, what else do you have to tell me? And I was so scared, man. I was like, just, and, uh, and it says, Patrick, you're a beautiful man with, with such a gentle, kind, loving spirit. Your compassion and understanding for others is remarkable. You're a true messenger of a loving God. You are confident. You shine such a bright light upon the world, except your darkness for that is where the light, where your light shines. You have an amazing life and so many positive things are just around the corner of the place you stand today. Be patient, be strong, continue to be a service to others. I used to always say the old timers would say, don't leave before the miracle, but they would never tell you what the miracle was. You son are an amazing man. Don't give up. You're an amazing father. You have taught Eden how to be kind, loving, gentle, and to care for others. Continue to provide boundaries and structure in his life. With your kind, gentle spirit, I am so proud of you. You have become an amazing man. Keep getting closer and closer to God and keep helping others. Just keep saying yes, Patrick. Even though you don't feel like you are loved by God and that you, uh, you are not being guided, 
I want you to know your life is about to get amazing. You have gone through a lot, but your strength is inspiring to so many. You are loved. I love you, Patrick. The last thing I want to say to you is to forgive yourself. Everyone in your life has forgiven you. It's time to let go of the shame and forgive yourself. You're a good man with a huge heart. I love you, mom. P.S. Let go of me physically and know that I am with you always. And I got off the floor that day and I walked off a free man. And I looked at my phone, right? And you know, your phone on iPhone, the favorites, my mom was number one. And I just, I just deleted her off of my favorites. And I remember when I was, I flashed back and I'm in four minutes. I got the timer guys promise. And uh, I used to throw my pennies away. You know what I'm saying? I used to who needs pennies? And I throw them away. And I remember that I, this guy told me that one of these rich guys in Orange County a long, long time ago, he used to always save his pennies. And I thought, man, dude, if that guy saves his pennies, I should save mine, you know? And so I talked to my mom. I said, mom, this guy I told her the story. And she said, Patrick, she said, I want you to know pennies are from heaven. This was like 15 years ago. She said that. And I've been keeping the pennies. I've been saving them because pennies. For, so then my mom's in the hospital. She's about to die. Literally, we had it. Literally, it was like the day she was dying. And I'm outside the hospital. And I look down and there's a penny. And uh, I'll tell you what, just about every day I find a penny on the floor. Just about every day I find a penny on the floor. And I'm reminded, right? I'm reminded of the spiritual side of this deal, right? Yeah, physically gone, spiritually right? They're always with, with us. You know what I mean? They're always with us, man. The, the physical world's a beautiful place. I choose to live in the spiritual side of this deal. If you're new here today, I want you to just know that I absolutely love Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a life beyond, right? Beyond. I am able to be present with you. Put me in the game, Ralph. Anytime. Put me in the game. I just want to be present with you. I love all of you. Man. I just love to be with you. We are characters and I mean, my feelings get hurt because I'm sensitive, but I love you. And I love, I just love being here. So thank you very much. I appreciate you all. Thank you.